morning and welcome to Christ Central Online. My name is Owen. I get to serve as one of the pastors here. And for those of you who are in the room today, it is so good to see you. And I look forward to seeing many more of you next week as we officially go into phase three of Christ Central Forward, or Forward Christ Central. Well, we're currently in a sermon series through the Gospel of Luke, which we're calling Following Jesus in the Book of Luke. And the goal of our series is really to follow Jesus around as he moves through the book of Luke. We're going to watch what he does. We're going to listen to what he says. All of our attention will be on him. And my prayer is that as we watch what Jesus does, as we listen to his teachings, that we will find Jesus more beautiful and more compelling than we already do, and that we will have greater certainty about the things that we have been taught, the things that we believe as Christians, that Jesus really is the Son of God, that he really is the Savior of the world, and that he really is worth following no matter what. And as we follow Jesus through the book of Luke, May the Holy Spirit teach us and empower us to follow Jesus through life. Now, the title of today's sermon is, uh, John Prepares the Way for Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 3, and we're going to read from verse 1 to 22. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 22. Uh, let me just warn you, there are some hard names in here that I'm going to have to try to pronounce, so don't laugh at me if I butcher these names. But there's a lot of names I have to this is the word of our God. Would you please give it your careful attention? In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Traconitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Ibeline, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance." And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. And every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages." As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and, and uh, for all the evil things that Herod had done, added, to this, uh, added this to them all that he locked up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, 
And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With, with you, I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Of all the gospel writers, Luke tells us the most about John the Baptist. Uh, Luke has already told us about how the birth of John was foretold by the angel Gabriel to Zechariah, and then how it was fulfilled even though Elizabeth, his mother, was old and barren. And in today's passage, Luke tells us now about John's ministry as the one who God had sent to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus. Now here's the outline of our passage for today. First, the message of of John. Second, the responses to John's message. And third, the one greater than John. So first, let's uh, let's look at John's message. As Luke has been doing since the very beginning of his book, he gives us the historical setting or the historical context for John's ministry. Luke dates John's ministry by mentioning seven historical figures, both political figures like uh, Tiberius Caesar and Pontius Pilate, and also religious figures like Annas and Caiaphas. Luke tells us that John began his ministry in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, which would be around 29 AD. Luke reminds us again, that his book is not fictional, it is historical. These things really happened in human history. So at around 29 AD, the word of God came to John. Now in John chapter 1, God promised that John would be the prophet of the Most High God. And just as the word of God came to the Old Testament prophets, so the word of God came to John, which means that John is like an Old Testament prophet. In fact, John is actually the last and the greatest Old Testament prophet, but he just happens to appear in the New Testament. John is the bridge figure between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In verses 4 to 6, Luke quotes Isaiah chapter 40, where God promised to send a figure who would be a voice crying out in the wilderness and one who would prepare the way of the Lord. Luke is telling us that John is the fulfillment of that promise found in Isaiah. John was that voice crying out in the wilderness. John is the one that God had sent to prepare the way of the Lord. Let's be reminded, friends, and be encouraged that God is faithful, and God always keeps and fulfills all of his promises. In verses 7 to 9, Luke summarizes for us the message that John repeatedly preached. John's message included three things according to our text. First, a warning of God's wrath which is to come. Second, a call to repent. And third, a warning against resting on your spiritual heritage. So let's look at these three elements of John's message. First, John's message included a warning of God's wrath, which is to come. In verse 7, he said, Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And in verse 9, he said, Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruits is cut down and thrown into the fire. These are references to the day of judgment. Because God is infinitely holy, good, and just, God hates sin, evil, and injustice, and God's wrath burns against them. And the day is coming when God's wrath will be fully unleashed upon them. Now, the wrath of God is an important topic and idea in both the Old and the New Testaments. Some people wrongly think that the Old Testament is all about God's wrath, while the New Testament is all about God's love. But that simply isn't true. You see, both the Old Testament and the New Testament talk about the love of God, and both the Old Testament and the New Testament talk about the love of God. Did you know that Jesus taught a lot about wrath and hell? In fact, I don't know if you know this, Jesus taught more on hell than he did on heaven. You see, friends, the topic of God's wrath and hell as the place where God's wrath will be fully unleashed and experienced is not a popular one. Nobody likes to listen to sermons on God's wrath and hell. In fact, 
Uh, not many preachers like to preach sermons on God's wrath and hell. I know I don't because it seems so harsh and mean to talk about God's wrath and hell. But did you know, friends, truly loving and faithful pastors will preach about the wrath of God so that they can warn their people about it and exhort them to escape it just as John did. You see, if God's wrath is real and if God's wrath is coming, then it would be utterly unloving and unfaithful for a pastor to not warn his people about them and to not proclaim the way of escape. That would be spiritual malpractice. Friends, I want to be to you a loving and faithful pastor. And that means that I need to repeatedly preach to you both the bad news and the good news. You see, the bad news is that the wrath of God is real and it really is coming. It's coming for sinners. It's coming for you. It's coming for me. It's coming for all of us because we are all sinners who deserve the wrath of God. That is the bad news. But the good news is that God is also merciful and loving and God has provided a way of escape from his wrath. You see, friends, God sent his son Jesus to save us from his wrath. On the cross, when Jesus suffered and died, he took the wrath of God that we deserved so that we wouldn't have to. And now, to everyone who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they can escape the wrath which is to come. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you will be able to escape God's wrath because Jesus endured God's wrath for you in your place as your substitute. And friends, the more we're convinced that the wrath of God is real, the more we're convinced that it is coming, the more we're convinced that we deserve the wrath of God for our sins and our injustices, the more we will love Jesus, the one who saved us from the wrath of God by taking it for us so that we wouldn't have to. Second, John's message also included a call to repentance. In verse 3, Luke tells us that John proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And in verse 8, John said to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. So according to John, there is a vital connection between repentance and forgiveness. So what is that connection? What is that relationship between repentance and forgiveness? Well, let me tell you in a statement and then let me unpack it for you. And here's my simple answer. Repentance is not the root of forgiveness, but the fruit of forgiveness. Let me say that again. Repentance is not the root of forgiveness, but the fruit of forgiveness. So let me go ahead and unpack that. First of all, repentance is not the root of forgiveness. That means that your repentance is not the cause of your forgiveness. God does not forgive you because you repent. God forgives your sins because Christ shed his blood for your sins. You see, only the blood of Christ and nothing but the blood of Christ can atone for our sins. Your repentance and your tears cannot save you from the wrath of God. Only Jesus, by his death and resurrection, can save you from that. The only way to be forgiven of your sins is through faith alone in Christ alone. So repentance is not the root of forgiveness. But at the same time, repentance is the fruit of forgiveness. You see, friends, you don't repent to be forgiven. You repent because you are already forgiven through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Repenting of your sins is the evidence or the proof that you are forgiven of your sins through faith in Christ. Friends, we are saved by faith alone. But we are never saved by faith that remains alone. True saving faith always produces good fruit, including the fruit of repentance. So your repentance is the fruit, the evidence, and the proof and the demonstration that you have truly been forgiven of your sins through your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me also say this too. True repentance is not motivated 
by a fear of hell. Let me say that again. True repentance is not motivated by a fear of hell. Rather, it is motivated by a love for the Savior who saved us from hell at such a high cost to himself. It is not God's wrath, but his kindness in Jesus that leads us to repentance. We repent not because we're afraid that God's going to send us to hell if we don't. We repent because we love Jesus, the one who first loved us and who was willing to experience hell and the wrath of God for us in our place so that he might save us. Friends, and now when we repent, it is not out of fear, but out of gratitude and love for our Savior. We repent because we want to live a life that is pleasing and honoring to the one that we love with all of our hearts. True repentance is always going to be rooted in love and gratitude, not fear, guilt, and shame. Third, John's message included a warning against resting on spiritual heritage. In verse 8, John said, And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. You see, the Jews that came to John thought that they were safe because they were Jews, because they were the physical descendants of Abraham. And because they were the physical descendants of Abraham, they didn't need to fear the wrath of God. But John says that their spiritual heritage as the children of Abraham means nothing. It means nothing when it comes to the wrath of God. Friends, I want you to listen to me. This is so important, especially if you were raised in the church. It doesn't matter if you were born and raised in a Christian home. It doesn't matter if your family went to church every Sunday. It doesn't matter if your parents are leaders in the church. It doesn't even matter if your dad is a pastor or a missionary. None of that matters. You see, friends, they cannot believe for you. They cannot repent for you. You see, believing and repenting is something that you must do. No one else can do them for you. So do not think that you're safe from God's wrath because of your spiritual heritage, because you were raised in a Christian home, because you went to church every Sunday, or because your parents, your mom or your dad are leaders and servants in the church. What matters is that you personally trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and that you personally repent of your sins, thus demonstrating that you truly are forgiven of your sins and that you've been reconciled to God through faith in Jesus Christ. What matters is your faith and your, your repentance, not your parents' faith and their repentance. So let me ask you this very important question, especially if you grew up in the church. Do you personally believe in Jesus? Do you personally repent of your sins? Those are the critical questions that you need to ask yourself and find the right answers to. Next, let's look at now the responses to John's message. So we know that we need to repent, but what does repentance look like? Well, in verses 10 to 14, Luke tells us about three groups of people. These three groups of people were convicted by John's message, and they came to John. They wanted to repent. And so they asked John, what then shall we do? What does repentance look like for us? So the first uh, group of people who come to John, uh, Luke calls the crowds in verse 10. These are the crowds. And they asked John, what are we supposed to do when we want to repent? Now, it's interesting that John does not tell them to go and do religious things. He doesn't tell them to go to the temple, offer sacrifices. He doesn't tell them to go pray and fast or to go read the Bible. He doesn't tell them to go do religious things. Instead, he tells them to go do merciful things, like meeting the needs of others. If you have two coats, give one away to someone who doesn't. If you have food, share your food with those who are hungry. You see, according to John, truly repentant people will care for the needs of others in practical and tangible ways, even at a cost to themselves. Truly repentant people will share their clothes, share their food, and share their resources with those who are in need. Truly repentant people will love their neighbors 
in real and tangible ways. You see, to refuse to share your resources with those in need reveals something in your heart. It reveals a lack of love for your neighbor. And John, the Apostle John tells us that you cannot love God without loving your neighbor. We see, you see, we demonstrate our love for God by loving those who are created in God's image. The Apostle John said this in 1 John chapter 3. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods, like clothes, food, and money, and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. The second group of people who came uh, to John were the tax collectors. And they ask, in verse 12, what they must do. And John tells them simply, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Now, tax collectors were Jewish people who purchased from Rome the right and the authority to collect taxes on Rome's behalf. And most of the tax collectors abused their authority and their power by collecting more taxes than they were supposed to, and then they pocketed the extra money for themselves. So, for example, if a tax collector was supposed to collect $1,000 from every family, they would go ahead and collect $1,500 from every family, give $1,000 back to Rome, and then pocket the extra $500 for themselves, right? You see, they had the authority and the power to do that, and the people who were being taxed could do nothing about it. So if you saw a rich tax collector like Zacchaeus, who we'll meet later on in this gospel, you know that he got rich because he abused his power and authority. He collected way more than he was supposed to. And that's why the people hated tax collectors so much, because tax collectors got rich by unfairly, overly taxing people who had no power and no recourse to do anything about that. Now, it's interesting that John doesn't tell tax collectors to stop being tax collectors. Rather, he tells them to stop abusing their power for selfish gain. He tells them to conduct themselves with integrity and honor in their profession. You see, collecting taxes is not sinful, but abusing your soldiers to leave their jobs. Rather, what did he tell them to do? Act justly. Act righteously. Act uprightly in your jobs. So according to John, what does repentance look like? Repentance looks like doing mercy. It meets the needs of others. Repentance looks like doing justice. It means doing what is right and treating others fairly, justly, and equitably. It, it, doing justice means not to abuse your power, position, and privilege to take advantage of the powerless and the vulnerable for your selfish gain. You know, friends, I think our text today gives us great insight into what true repentance is. True repentance is more than just feeling bad or feeling sorry for the bad things that you've done. True repentance is not doing religious acts, like going to the temple and offering sacrifices or praying or fasting or reading the Bible. That's not what true repentance is. True repentance has both vertical dimensions and horizontal dimensions. True repentance produces both a godly sorrow over sin toward God and a life of mercy and justice toward other people. You see, toward God, repentance involves confession and sorrow over sins and the injustices that we've committed. There's definitely a vertical dimension where we confess our sin and we feel sorrow for our sins and injustices. And at the same time, there's a horizontal dimension toward man, Repentance involves doing mercy and justice. Toward man, justice involves doing mercy, like sharing your clothes, your food, and your resources with those who don't have any. Toward man, repentance looks like doing justice, doing what is right, doing what is fair, and not abusing your position, power, or privilege over others for selfish gain. In other words, toward man, repentance looks like loving your neighbors, and doing unto them what you would have them do unto you. 
You see, friends, how we treat others, especially the poor and the needy, and how we use our position and our power toward those who are powerless and vulnerable, that reveals whether our repentance is true or not. So let me ask you, do you keep and hoard all your resources for yourself and just for your family? Or do you generously share your resources with those who are in need? Or do you always do everything in your power to make sure that you get the best possible deal for yourself without, with little or no regard for the impact on the, on the, on the other person? Are you always thinking about your angle or your company's angle to get yourself the best possible deal? Or do you seek to be fair and just and honest in all of your business deals and dealings? And are you willing to use whatever position, power, and privilege that God has entrusted to you to help and to advocate for the vulnerable and the voiceless? Or do you use it all to take advantage of other people because it's legal? True repentance isn't primarily seen in how much you pray, how much you fast, or how much you read your Bible. True repentance is seen in how you treat other people. Do you treat people mercifully and compassionately? Do you treat people fairly, justly, and uprightly? The truly repentant person is the person who loves mercy. So John prepared the way of Jesus by calling people to repent, and we see the various responses of repentance. And lastly, let's look at this. John pointed to Jesus, the one greater than John. Because John's ministry was so powerful and because people's lives were changing, people began to wonder and to ask, could John be the Christ? Could John be the Messiah? And John adamantly denies it. And John actually says, there is one coming who is so much mightier than me that I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. I baptize with water, but he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Of course, John was referring to Jesus. Now, to say uh, that Jesus baptizes or will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire, now, there's a lot of uh, different uh, ways to understand this. Uh, a lot of Bible commentators have different interpretations, but I think the right one is this. This is the one I believe, okay? Uh, to say that Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire means that Jesus will give the Holy Spirit generously to those who believe in him and repent, and those who reject him and do not repent, he will judge with fire. Okay? You see, in verse 17, it says that Jesus has a winnowing fork in his hand. That's a tool that farmers use to sift, to separate. So what is Jesus going to do? He's going to come and he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. That's what Jesus does as the, as the judge. He separates the wheat and the chaff. And, 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 and Jesus says that he will gather up the wheat and bring into his uh, barn while the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So John tells us that the Jesus who is coming is the judge and he will separate the chaff from the wheat. Now the wheat are those who believe in Jesus and produce the good fruit of repentance, and the chaff are those who reject Jesus and do not repent. And here I need to pause, and I need to ask you a question again. Are you wheat, or are you chaff? Are you wheat that will be gathered into the barns of salvation, or are you chaff that will be burned up with unquenchable fire? You see, if you believe in Jesus and if you repent as a result of that faith, you are wheat. You belong to Christ and you'll be brought into the barns of salvation. But if you reject Jesus and if you do not repent, you are chaff and you will be burned. Today, my job is to call all of you here in the room and those of you who are watching. My job is to call you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to repent and to prove that you are, that you are wheat. 
and also to warn you. I have to warn you that if you reject Jesus and if you do not repent, you are chaff and you will be burned. I get no pleasure in saying something like that. But I have to be true to God's word because it's in the Bible. And that is ultimately the most loving thing I can do to you by, by telling you what's actually in the word. Not just telling you what you want to hear, but telling you what you need to hear so that you might be saved from the wrath of God which is to come. Friends, but here's the good news. Jesus didn't come just to be the judge of the world. He came to be the savior of the world. You see, because of our sins, we deserve the wrath of God which is to come. Because of our sins, we're the fruitless trees that deserve to be cut down and thrown into the fire. We, uh, for our sins, we're the ones, we're, we're the chaff that deserve to be thrown into unquenchable fire. But Jesus, because of his great love for us, he came to save us. And he saved us by taking that judgment upon himself for us as our substitute. You see, on the cross, Jesus endured the wrath of God for us. On the cross, Jesus was cut down and thrown into the fire for us. On the cross, Jesus was thrown into that unquenchable fire. You see, friends, Jesus is not only the judge of the world, but more importantly, he is the savior of the world. He's the one who has saved us. And we get to escape God's wrath because Jesus endured God's wrath for us in our place as our substitute. And friends, when you see Jesus bearing and taking the judgment of God for you, when you see him suffering and dying for you, when you see that kind of love, that love will move you and it will make you begin to love him back. You see, when you see God come as a man, suffering and dying for you, taking the wrath of God for you, when you see your, when you're loved like that, it, it, it breaks you, it makes you want to weep, because who could love you like that? And yet Jesus says, I love you so much that I was willing to die for you. I was willing to take the wrath of God for you so that you wouldn't have to. And when you see how kind and how gracious and how merciful Jesus has been to you, that's when you begin to want to be kind and merciful and gracious to others. When you see God being so kind to you in Christ when you don't deserve it, that's when you begin to find the power to be kind to others when they don't deserve it. Friends, the only way to live a life of mercy and justice to live a life of love and service to others is when you see that Jesus has been merciful and just to you. They say hurt people hurt people. Same time, loved people love people. Forgiven people forgive people. Served people serve people. As God has treated you in Jesus, so we are now to treat others just as God has treated us. So what? Let me wrap this up. What's the takeaway for today? In this series, we've been thinking about this question. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does following Jesus look like? Well, from our text, we learn that part of that answer is this. Part of following Jesus means living a life of repentance, which is a life of both godly sorrow for your sin toward God and a life of mercy and justice toward man. Today, I want to ask you, I want to leave you with these questions. What should repentance look like for you personally? In what ways can you show mercy and compassion to those who are in need? In what ways can you be just, right, fair, honest, a man and woman of integrity in your place of employment or, or profession? In what ways can you steward the position, the power, and the privileges that God has given to you so that you might use it to advocate for the voiceless and the vulnerable? In what ways can true repentance show up beautifully in your life? Christ central, may your gospel-fueled repentance 
that would only reveal your godly sorrow over your sin toward God, but may it also be revealed in your conduct toward others as you are committed to living a life of mercy and justice. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word today. And I pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would apply your word to our hearts, that it might produce in us true repentance, both a godly sorrow over our sins as we look to you, and at the same time, producing a life of love, mercy, and justice as we look to one another. Would you do this in us for the glory of Christ and for the good of the world? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.